Hello, my name is Andrew and welcome back to All About Russia. In today's video we're going to be looking at the titular nation of the Bashkortostan Republic, the Bashkirs. The Bashkirs, or Bashkotor in their native language, are a Turkic ethnic group primarily found in the Republic of Bashkortostan. As of the 2010 census, there are over one and a half million Bashkirs across the Russian Federation, with a million of those found in the Republic of Bashkortostan alone. Additionally, Bashkirs can be found in large numbers within the Chelyabinsk Oblast, the Orenburg Oblast, the Tumen Oblast, the Perm Oblast, and the Sverdlovsk Oblast. Internationally, they can also be found in large numbers in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. As stated in the video on Bashkortostan, check it out if you haven't. The name Bashkirs has a few potential sources, with the most likely of these being an old Turkic term for head wolves. Historically, the Bashkirs were divided into 30 clans, and ranged over an area much wider than modern Bashkortostan. As such, differences in lifestyle emerged, with those tribes in the south and east being generally more nomadic and pastoral than those in the north and west were more settled and agricultural. The Bashkirs are a Turkic people and of course speak a Turkic language. It is in the Kipchak branch of the Turkic family tree and possesses a degree of intelligibility with other Turkic languages such as Tatar and Kazakh. Within the Bashkir language there are three main dialects, southern, northwestern and eastern the latter being the literary language used. For those of you interested, it sounds a little like this. Traditionally, the Bashkirs used a runic script, but with their mass conversion to Islam in the 10th century, they began to use Chagatai an extinct Persian Arabic based script. In 1923 this was formalised with own Arabic script, only to be revised to a Latin script in 1930, and finally a Cyrillic script in 1939, which is used today. The first written mention of the Bashkirs potentially comes from the 5th century Greek father of history, Herodotus, who refers to the Agrippians being in the southern Urals, an area roughly corresponding to modern Chelyabinsk Oblast and the Republic of Bashkortostan. However, the first official written record of the Bashkirs comes from the 7th century Chinese source Book of Sui, who refers to the Bashukili residing in the southern Urals. By the 9th century AD, Arab explorers were recording the Bashkirs as being semi nomadic, polytheistic spread across the southern Urals. Around this time, perhaps influenced by their neighbours the Volga Bulgarians, several Bashkir tribes adopted Islam as their faith in this period. This was not universal however, and it is thought some tribes actually left and migrated with the Magyar tribes entering what is now Hungary. In 1220, the easternmost Bashkir tribes came into conflict with the encroaching Mongols. Over the next 16 years, the Bashkirs would repeatedly fight the Mongols as they encroached further and further onto their territory, showing an admirable battle prowess. This was so much so that in 1236, when the full might of the Mongol Empire was brought to bear on the Bashkirs, only then did they accept to become vassals of the Mongols and under certain stipulations. In contrast to many of the peoples overtaken by the Mongols, their autonomy was respected and Bashkir warriors were recruited into Mongol service. As a people of the Mongol Empire and later the Golden Horde, the Bashkirs as a people were utilised to great effect as horsemen and their autonomy largely respected with a few notable revolts to secure this respect. With the adoption of Islam as the official state religion of the Golden Horde in 1313, the Bashkirs thrived, allowed now to enter other positions of leadership and command within the Golden Horde structure. However, their position in the eastern part of the Golden Horde also left them exposed to the fury of Timurlane. And in the 14th century, he ravaged much of Bashkiria and killed many Bashkirs in his assault and war on top of Timish. As the Golden Horde fragmented, the widely spread Bashkir tribes found themselves split in both geographical position and loyalty between three arising Khanates. The Khanates of Kazan, Astrahan 
and Sibir. These Bashkir tribes would play important roles in all three of the Khanates, but notably in the Khanate of Siberia, where they would play a hindering force to Russian colonization. In 1552, the Khanate of Kazan fell, putting for the first time some Bashkir tribes nominally under the suzerainty of the Tsar. Surprisingly, given his moniker, Ivan the Terrible actually came to a very similar agreement to that as the Khans had had with this Bashkir people before, respecting their autonomy and including them in the military. This is so much so that in Bashkir folklore, Ivan the Terrible is known as the White Tsar or the Good Tsar. As we will see, not all of the Tsars that came afterwards would share this moniker. As the Russian state moved further eastward and eastward, more and more Bashkir tribes began to be included within the Russian state. And in 1662, the Russian state would try something which again and again would prove to be a bad idea. What is this, you ask? They tried to revoke Bashkir privileges. In total, there would be eight rebellions involving the Bashkirs, sometimes fighting against land infringements, other times against proselytization, and sometimes against the injustices faced by the Bashkir people themselves. And in the beginning, the Bashkirs actually did pretty well. The first three rebellions in 1662, 1681 and 1704 saw Bashkir land rights confirmed and Orthodox missionaries banished from Bashkiria. The fourth rebellion in 1735 is where the tide began to turn against the Bashkirs. And with the Bashkirs losing and having 40,000 people either killed or deported from their lands. What is arguably worse is that they began losing rights to land, in this case having some of their pastoral land ceded to the Mishka Tatars. 20 years later another Bashkir revolt was organised which reaffirmed their rights to land but came at huge human cost. This only laid seeds for future resentment and in 1775 when Yemelian Pugachev rose in revolt the Bashkirs quickly flocked to his banner. Many of the Bashkir tribes that joined Pugachev only did so because they were following one of their own, a minor chief called Salavat Yulayev, who is in some ways like the Bashkir version of the Native American folk hero Crazy Horse, rallying thousands of Bashkirs against the Tsar and against Russian imperialism. Despite losing, having thousands of his countrymen killed and leading to the tribal system to be eroded by the Russian state, Salavat is a Bashkir national hero today, remembered in songs and poems as a freedom fighter and revolutionary for the Bashkir people. It is at this point reminding ourselves that historically the Bashkirs actually roamed over a much wider area than they do today, encompassing many of the neighbouring oblasts. With each passing rebellion, more Bashkirs fell and their numbers were not so quick to recover. Additionally, Attitudes by the Russian state towards national minorities were changing, and previous exemptions from military service were being taken away, including the Bashkir cavalry being recruited and used to deadly effect against the Poles in the War of the Bar Confederation, and again against the Swedes in 1778. By 1798, Bashkir power had been diminished so much so that the Tsar revoked one of the privileges the Bashkirs had enjoyed up until that time. The privilege of only serving in the Russian army during times of war. With this, thousands of Bashkirs were sent to the border regions of Central Asia and the Russian Far East to act as cavalry patrols. Yet, in a strange twist, whilst Bashkir identity and power was being eroded and diminished at home, abroad it was expanding. Due to Napoleon's invasion of Russia, huge numbers of Bashkirs were sent westward to harry le grand Army. This led to their exotic character leaving a distinct impression on the Germans, Dutch and French they passed on their way, seeing Bashkirs, who they often misnamed as Amurs, being seen as the epitome of the mystic and barbaric East, and immortalising them in art and folk memory. Within Russia, Bashkir power was of course diminishing and being eroded away, and it was beginning to be concentrated in a much smaller area, the area we now consider the Republic of Bashkortostan. Since the 1905 revolution, Bashkir intellectuals and nationalists had debated and discussed the future of the Bashkirs in coffee shops and yurts and fields. In 1917, however, with the abdication of the Tsar, religious suppression laws saw many mosques closed the Bashkir people rose up and an anonymous Bashkirdistan arose. Whilst unrecognised, 
Zeki Tagan would come to lead this quasi state and successfully managed to raise Bashkir forces to see off the encroaching Red Army as well as white forces coming from the east. Unfortunately, their position made neutrality impossible despite a gallant defence. As mentioned in our Bashkortistan video, in March of 1919, Bashkortostan switched its loyalties and allowed Red Army forces to cross Bashkiria. This was due to the change in Bolshevik policy on national minorities, which now permitted national autonomy. However, once on Bashkir's soil, that same national autonomy was not respected and invariably led to atrocities being committed against the Bashkirs. In our video on Bashkortostan, we did touch upon this but did not go into great detail as that video did not pertain to the Bashkir people particularly but the land around them. In this video I think it would be important to go in a bit more detail about what happened to the Bashkirs during these dark days. The fall of Bashkirdistan would mark a dark period in Bashkir history, with Bashkir land divided between the Orenburg Oblast and the Bashkir SSR. This was to divide further the Bashkir people, to attempt to prevent them from revolting again. Any ideas of autonomy were quickly crushed and a guerrilla campaign arose from 1920 to 1922, again seeing thousands of ethnic Bashkirs killed. Through a campaign of violence, enforced starvation, as well as exposure to the elements, it has been estimated up to 800,000 ethnic Bashkirs died from the 1917-1922 period. With the rise of Joseph Stalin, things did not improve and Imams deported throughout Bashkiria, whilst the collectivization policies drove many Bashkirs from their semi-nomadic existence into squat living conditions. This too saw the Sovietization of the Bashkirs, with their identity being gradually replaced with that of the Soviet citizen. The war years of 1941 to 1945 were hugely important in the history of the Bashkirs. Of the 700,000 Bashkirs who volunteered to fight in the Red Army, around 300,000 did not return. A tiny number of Bashkirs who had been captured were actually recruited from German prison of war camps and recruited into the Volga Tatarish Legion. Thankfully, the huge numbers of Bashkirs who did fight the Germans, as well as the fact Bashkortostan was nowhere near the front line, rendered Stalin pliable to not deport them a fate that others would not be so lucky to avoid. Post-war years saw a greater advocation of the Basque identity within the Soviet framework and their Turkic identity was less celebrated as a result. The fact that Bashkiria was far away from the front lines left it undamaged and in the post-war years the thriving industrial and agricultural sectors saw many people from across the Soviet Union move to Bashkiria. However, in the 1980s with the Soviet thaw, this actually brought some complications to the surface. Since the 1940s, neighbouring Tatars had been moving into Bashkiria, and their influence was seen as something of a cultural threat by many Bashkirs. This was because Tatar was already quite widely spoken amongst the Bashkirs, as opposed to Bashkir itself, and the increasing Islamification and religious revival of course, many of the Muslim groups of the Soviet Union were seen to be led by the Tatars. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, this actually threatened to spill out into fighting, with protests and movements to separate from Russia and expel the Tatars, who in turn threatened to secede and join Tatarstan. Today, however, relations between Bashkirs and Tatars are much better. The Bashkir people of today are very much Russian citizens, as well as Sunni Muslims. Whilst the Bashkirs are Sunni Muslims, it's worth mentioning that many follow different sects to those of the people of the Caucasus, where they have less of a Wahhabist interpretation and instead more of a Hanafi or rational interpretation of their beliefs. Today, there are actually very few remnants of the Bashkirs' pre-Islamic history. One of the few remnants that does remain, however, are the poems and national epics of the Bashkir people, of which the most famous is probably the Abkhazat, which is a heroic story of a Bashkir prince rescuing his people from slavery. The Bashkirs are a nation of storytellers, and whilst many of their poems and epics come from mythology and prehistory, they also have many written about events that have actually taken place in written history. As mentioned prior, 
Selavad Gulayev is a national folk hero and is the protagonist of more than one story. Bashkir national dress takes a lot of influence from life on the steppes in southern Russia. The Yelian, a robe with fur trimming popular among many of the other people from the Volga region, is the national dress of the Bashkirs. The Yelian for men are worn loosely over other clothes, often of plain colours. For women, however, the robe is fitted and tends to be worn with a greater array of colours and even jewellery, such as coins and beans to adorn them. The national dish of the Bashkirs is Beshmamak, a meat and noodle based dish perfect for the cold climes of the Urals. It's worth mentioning that, as we mentioned in the Bashkir video, beekeeping is a popular pastime and historically always has been amongst the Bashkirs, with arguably some of the best honey in the world being produced by them. As such, honey plays a large part in cultural celebrations. As before stated, the Bashkirs are a largely sunny Muslim people with few remnants of their pre-Islamic past. In addition to stories and poems, one aspect of this can be found, however, in their national holidays. Kargatui and Habatui are traditional spring and summer festivals centered around the harvest, complete with offerings and competitions in wrestling, horse racing, and even pot smashing. One festival held that harks back to Bashka history is the Yiyin, a festival that immediately follows a coral tie or tribal meeting. The Bashkirs are an ancient and proud people, stalwart against the trials and tribulations they have faced over the centuries. With Bashkir identity and nationalism on the rise, more and more Russians are finding their Bashkir roots and looking to celebrate their proud and dramatic history. My name is Andrew and thank you for watching. Up next are the Besame. Paka!